Hello and welcome to my Houdini Hive talk about control, creating reactive environments. I'm not doing this live from San Francisco, sadly. I'm uh, doing this from my home office, a place where I guess a lot of VFX artists in film and games are working these days. I want to um, use the opportunity to thank Side Effects for uh, letting me showcase our work and how Houdini has been quite an integral part in our workflows to create those procedural reactive destruction pieces. And um, without further ado, I'd say we better start. Uh, I want to start first with maybe introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Johannes Richter. Uh, I'm principal VFX artist um, at Remedy. And uh, I used to work in film uh, as effects supervisor and effects artist for more than 10 years at Framestore in London most of my time, but also a while at the mill. And I had a stint at Animal Logic long time ago in Sydney. And uh, I had uh, the chance and pleasure uh, to work on many different films, um, uh, but decided uh, at the beginning of last year to sort of pivot a bit in, into sort of interactive mediums, as in games. And uh, yeah, that's when I started working at Remedy. Now, Remedy probably doesn't need that big of an introduction because they've been around for a long time. Remedy is based in Espo in Finland and Espo is right next to Helsinki on the southern coast. Um, and Remedy has been known for 20 years, 20 plus years for their iconic narrative driven action games. So um, Max Payne is sort of the thing that comes to mind and Alan Wake and uh, Quantum Break and also Control, which was released last summer. Now, uh, just to position myself a little bit on the map, quite literally, uh, I'm where the red bit is on that globe over there, um, particularly there right now, this is where Finland is. Um, now let me uh, introduce Control. Uh, Control is a supernatural third-person action adventure. So you play as Jesse Faden, who sort of walks into this government agency, the Federal Bureau of Control, on kind of a mission you're not really sure about, and then quite quickly you happen to become that agency's director. And then you basically have to go in and sort stuff out. Um, and uh, now talking about the content of the uh, presentation I'm going through today is I want to talk about the challenges. I want to sort of quite, quite clearly paint the picture of what we wanted to attain um, with this project and with our approach doing the visual effects for it. Um, and then I want to talk how we did it, how we tackled those uh, challenges, how we, how we tried to solve them uh, in a big section about those reactive environments. And I want to do a little bit of a retrospect at the end, talking about the lessons we've learned, the things you would do different, and maybe the things that also went quite well. Now, the challenges. Location, haptics, and limitation. Starting with the location. The location being the oldest house, that's sort of the name of the place, and it's almost like a character in the game because you walk in and you kind of um, are surrounded by this changing walls and it's sort of something you explore and you get to know over the course of the entire game. And quite significant of it is its architecture. So we're talking brutalism, uh, which is sort of lots of board and concrete and wood and, and very sharp corners and stairs and steps and uh, quite how you would imagine a government agency to look like. Um, the believability was a very big aspect. So it's a government agency with thousands of agents walking about and trying to you know, solve the mysteries of the world. Um, and uh, it had to be believable because you needed to be able to tell that people are working there. They, they sort of spend their day there. They have their coffee and they have their telephones and, uh, um, and it needed to be rich and, and very sort of uh, believable in that regard. And lighting was a very big aspect of the artistic vision of the game. So very accentuated, very cinematic lighting. And, and that got carried in the end from actually even using uh, very new tech as one of the first games uh, controls actually implementing RTX uh, features, ray tracing on the GPU in real time. Um, and that played a very big part in the visual style and the sort of the storytelling via light. And not to forget, uh, and I will be talking about materials a lot today, materials. 
Brutalism is boarded concrete and you kind of already know how that feels like by just seeing it. Uh, same as for the exposed wood and the metal and the glass and all that very um, very rough uh, 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 sort of man-made kind of feel to it. And those materials played quite a big role in the design of the game. And they play straight into haptics because um, we wanted to create a rich and reactive environment that conveys the sense of being able to interact with anything inside of it. And it had to be very consistent. So you were supposed to, you know, easily just bump into a chair and the chair moves and things fall off the desk. And obviously you have superpowers. Uh, and superpowers meaning you can take that chair and launch it at an enemy or you can rip a bit of wall out of the wall and throw that at the enemy. You can even pick up the enemy and throw that enemy at another enemy. And um, that was sort of uh, a level of interaction with the environment that really demanded to be very consistent and very believable to make it rewarding and fun. Uh, and now playing Control, this is fun. This is really great to play. And that was quite a, um, a part of the goal. Um, now, the last challenge was essentially the limitations, because uh, when you go in and you want to achieve all those different artistic uh, and, and haptic goals, uh, so you want it to be realistic and rewarding and have a physical impact in there. That is really like sort of you feel the, the energy in it and you want to create havoc wherever you go. Then you also kind of have to think of, please don't do that all too much, because um, uh, compared to film, you have to do this not offline. You have to do this online as in 30 frames a second. Um, and that obviously means um, you got to consider performance and memory and uh, at all times. But you also have to consider AI requirements to block uh, a character's path so the AI can, the AI can um, sort of act properly. And uh, we also had to consider that we were a very small team. So the whole destruction uh, part of this reactive environments part of this was um, essentially catered for by a team between one and three people. So reactive environments, I'm, I'm saying that a lot, uh, rigid body dynamics, particles, decals, and additional systems, but what does that even mean? Um, and uh, yeah, just to demo that quickly, I'm gonna show you a bit of a clip of what it meant in control. I want to start by um, going a little bit abstract and talking about a fundamental uh, thinking behind uh, sort of the structure of what we did, um, because it's quite nicely structuring uh, how to explain what we did. And that is what I will call the principle of granularity. This is not an official term. I kind of coined that myself because I couldn't find an official term, but it is a thing that you always do when you create I guess, visuals in general or visual effects in general, you are looking at trying to represent every, sing every level of detail in, in the thing you're making. Um, uh, so if you look at, uh, you make a, a sort of a scene of a collapsing skyscraper, we start with like big objects. So you have this big breaking building and you see it sort of breaking into building shaped parts that are sort of cr collapsing and crumbling. And then, yes, it's crumbling. So there's smaller parts that might not be that recognizable anymore. It's like, hey, this is a bit of building, but um, those chunks then also crumble. And then there's sort of debris and smaller bits and rocks that are sort of quite nondescript, but lots of them. Um, and, uh, and then you have even smaller ones, pebbles and things shooting out, like really tiny bits shooting out. And then you have dust, dust trails and bits shooting about. And then just a general notion of like foggy pluminess, a very, very thin, fine granular stuff that fills the air. And that um, sort of is what I call a gradient of granularity, um, a gradient of detail that uh, sort of has a very important uh, function when you create a visual effect like that, it conveys a sense of scale. It gives you an idea of sort of where does this fit into the world and it makes it fit better into the world as well. Uh, and that's why this is such a crucial thing. 
and this is sort of the principle that we wanted to adhere to but obviously we're looking at running this in a game engine uh, so we had to kind of find the right things to represent all the different levels now starting uh, on the left with the environment obviously you're looking at some geometry that someone makes and that becomes then a rigid body simulated thing probably a triangle mesh collision um, where you can just walk around on and that works quite nice and then you go to like objects that quite often are represented again as rigid bodies then usually with um, sort of convex hull or primitive collision like you know spheres or boxes or convex hulls and then you go a bit further then you have chunks some of them might still be rigid bodies and you try to get very abstract in their collision that you don't have to uh, spend so much performance on that essentially and then you're starting to move into some of them being just particles with instanced geometry bits on them uh, because that is uh, like cheaper to uh, um, to to use and then uh, you go one step further then you have debris that isn't even geometry anymore it's just a billboard with a texture on it that shows a, a bit of grain a bit of sand a bit of spark and then at the very end you have the bigger sprite billboards that are then um, usually sprite atlases of dust plumes of dust animation that are then uh, rendered uh, overlaid to create sort of the fine granular stuff and that gets us from all the way on the left to the big pieces to all the finest stuff on the right um, which uh, sort of is our gradient uh, that we can represent within the engine. Now workflow wise uh, we are fairly run of the mill this is kind of the order of things that you would expect if you have an environment build someone builds the world level geometry uh, quite often made out of module kits so you know there's a lot of repetition in those buildings uh, railings and stairs and pillars they are sort of the same and, uh, and then you have a lot of props in there uh, and they're all just being modeled and uh, created and they being fed into a destruction setup uh, and that is the big part of it is a systemic setup uh, to deal with a lot of stuff and some prop rigs and some cinematic animation for special cases and that then is being rendered uh, or and processed sort of at runtime in our Northlight engine, which is our proprietary in-house developed uh, engine uh, where the game would be running in. Now, here an example. This is the lobby of our research sector. Um, and uh, you sort of see here all the static geometry in that shot. So really what is in here, uh, none of that actually ever moves in the game. And you're like, oh, that's kind of, uh, that's quite a lot. And I was quite surprised myself how, how much of, it, of the game actually doesn't move. Considering once you play the game, you feel like, wow, I can really, I can really destroy a lot of things in there. So, um, and if you go one step further, um, then we are adding breakable objects. That's sort of um, not a prop. It's more like, you know, the stuff the environment might be made of. And really in this particular case, and there are probably cases that showcase a bit more, but I like this angle for the other things I want to show uh, are uh, the concrete uh, railings um, on the stairs, for example. They have been added now. They are kits and uh, you can break them. You can do something with them. And the really big part that then comes into play is when you start adding the props and all the breakable and interactable pieces. So benches and displays and desks and planters and all those kind of things. And, uh, and that is sort of the strong suit in, in how everything is designed in the oldest houses. There is some really um, thought through propping going on that sort of allows to convey the sense of space, what it was meant for, and also allows us to go wild in them and throw the stuff at the head of someone we don't like. Now, go procedural. Um, that is sort of quite a buzzword um, at the moment everything is procedural and uh, for good reason but what does it even mean uh, now really going procedural means uh, to uh, use rules to interpret and process data and so what you take is some bit of data whatever it is uh, and then you apply some rules to it and see okay do the rules apply to the data and if they do then you do something predefined by that rule with the data and out comes more data um, change data, maybe less data when you start deleting things, etc. But sort of some amended version of the input data, and that is really what proceduralism, proceduralism is in in its sort of most abstract view. Now, if we look at procedural destruction, what does that mean? Well, it's it is the data-driven approach. So you want to have input data geometry that drives 
uh, how it breaks, maybe metadata drives how it breaks, and then uh, that brings Houdini into play, which has been at the forefront of proceduralism since its uh, conception, basically, um, and uh, is like the perfect tool to establish those kind of things and uh, to give you just a perspective why we wanted to do this. Um, so on the top right, you see a, a selection of sort of breakable environment pieces, module kits that had to be sort of addressed pillars and bits of wall and planters and, and railings and stairs and on the bottom right you see a selection of props that had to be broken um, and uh, that was a lot of hundreds if not thousands of variations of things um, and we needed a consistent and fast turnaround and we needed to have this predictable like as in you make a thing and you break it and you make a thing that's almost the same it should break almost the same way so that had really had to had to be reliable and we only had a very small team so there was no way to do those all by hand piece by piece bespoke um too costly and not flexible enough uh, so that's why procedural destruction was sort of the thing i think it's quite canonical if you think about it now Go procedural, it is. So we want to use rule-based processing and interpretation of that world data. And the data that we're getting, uh, in this case, is primitives and points and UVs and geometric hierarchies and material metadata. And that is the crucial part. It wasn't just a mesh, it was a mesh that knew what it was made of. So we had tags on the geometry that said, hey, I'm concrete and hey, and I'm wood and hey, and I'm glass. And that would... Um, drive the rules uh, so the system would pick those pieces based on their material and then apply a specific set of things something out of concrete would say hey we're going to prepare you to be broken into children into bits uh, or uh, when you're being shot you will spawn some dust uh, or a metal pipe when you're being shot you will spawn some water and we're going to apply a decal like a texture decal that would make you look like you're a bit dented that is sort of the, the rules and they would be defined for any kind of material that we would uh, support. And, uh, and then that would be uh, um, sort of fed, that data would be fed into the engine with the knowledge about the materials and that would then do the impact, the effect. So you shoot something out of wood, there would be wood splinters flying um, or you break something out of glass and it would be sort of doing glass breaking things and uh, it would determine the rigid body behavior that's going on in that kind of circumstance. Now, here you see um, three videos, and I'm sorry for the lag. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a concrete breaking. So that is just Jesse shooting the railing. And then uh, it's a little demonstration of a tool that we have. So you can see a little mouse pointer coming in, and then it just everything breaks, which is really nice. You can just say, hey, whenever I click, it just falls apart. So that gives a good demo of what is going on. Uh, the same happens with the uh, wood in the middle and the glass on the right and all of them have their own behavior the way they are breaking. Now I want to uh, demonstrate this on an, on an example just to take you through the details of this. So let's break an environment piece. Let's break this kit piece of uh, concrete and wood like some kind of railing um, and uh, that piece of GU came in and we said okay let's prepare this to be destroyed. So what we do is we break it into individual layers um, of uh, sort of breakage. So on the left, the unbroken, then level A as number two, sort of breaking into some bits. Um, you can see wood's breaking a bit different than the concrete. Um, and uh, it might look actually a little bit uniform, but nothing ever breaks into all its pieces at the same time. This is sort of just where it could break. Uh, the next level, that would be the next level of breakage, you then see that you have um, sort of edge decals applied. Um, they, uh, uh, it would be bad to have them on the first level because then as soon as you shoot a thing, you would see all the cracks. So you do this on the next level just to, to sort of avoid, um, avoid having the breakage to become sort of very generic. Um, and then you see that uh, the wood doesn't even have the last level because after being broken twice, it's basically just splinters. So we don't have the third layer uh, for performance reasons and sort of uh, detail reasons. And uh, yeah, and then the concrete would break up one more into more pieces. And we call that levels of chunk hierarchy. So I might refer to that like that from now on. So the destruction tool chain uh, would uh, be, as you kind of imagine it is, you have prop geometry come in from environments, from our environment department, and then there would be some kind of model prep that needed to be done. And historically, that was 3ds Max. Now, for me as a film person, that is like 
uh, time travel, uh, but uh, it's uh, been widely used um, uh, for those uh, purposes still in games. So uh, yeah, there's some model prep happening in there. Uh, and then we pump this into what we call the auto destruction tool, um, authored by my colleague Mati. Um, and uh, that sort of takes care of the breakage for the different materials. And, uh, and then afterwards, sometimes you have to go in and tweak a bunch of things uh, in terms of physics materials and physics metadata. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And that then again goes into Northlight to be uh, simulated. Now, the model prep looks like this. Um, you essentially have a piece of geo and then you provide some cutting geo or retainer geo or keep a geo uh, that would sort of uh, prepare the geo um, geometry uh, to be cut. And then you just push a button in 3ds max so you name your geometry the right names like cutter and keeper and something like that uh, and then you push a button it would launch Houdini batch in the back end and load the geometry in including those auxiliary meshes that determine how the stuff breaks and the tool would then do this it would take the cutters uh, sort of cut the geometry at rebars and at all the different layers for wood for concrete for glass for other things um, and provide render and collision geometry um, and export that into something that can go straight into engine. And the cool thing is we could kind of hot load that. So you basically do this, you hit export, you hit shift R in the game, and you would see your breaking object in front of you. You can shoot it, it would break. If you don't like it, you go uh, potentially back, change your cutter a bit and do the same thing. Not super, super real time. The tool itself took a little bit to run. Uh, so you wait like a minute sometimes because uh, I just do boot up, etc. But uh, overall, this is kind of how that worked. Um, and a destruction hierarchy that comes out of that, you see this here on the right, uh, is basically just a mesh hierarchy. Um, so from top to bottom, you go like level A, level B, um, and then you have the collision shapes, uh, uh, and then they, they know what they're made of. So they're made out of concrete and they're being tagged as that. And uh, those hierarchy layers are basically the stages of breaking. And those physics properties are driven by naming conventions. So you name something um, chunk, something, something, it would be a chunk, you name something shape, uh, concrete, it would then be a shape made out of concrete, uh, shape being the collision shape. And uh, I mean, everything set up correctly, everything would just be reliably handled by the engine, uh, which would be sort of the moment where you like, uh, celebrate. <laughs> Now, the simulation entities, the things we actually simulate in engine, I just want to uh, talk about them briefly uh, to give you an, an insight in that, uh, is rigid bodies, normal RBD, rigid body dynamics. Uh, you roll them around. Then we have something called chunks, and they have bonds, and I'll talk about that in a sec. And we have joints, which is, you can, uh, like constraints, Houdini constraints, basically. If you have rigid bodies, you can tie together with a, with a revolute, uh, like a hinge constraint or some other constraints like that. Um, chunk bonds are a little bit special um, because they are created at initialization time and uh, basically to, to convey a, sort of a, a, a structure to a thing, any, any, any leaf nodes in that hierarchy would be bonded together with sort of a, 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 um, like a compound mechanism. It's not a constraint. They're basically considered the same rigid body until they break into sub-rigid bodies. It's an aggregate kind of composite kind of principle and um, that would be initialized at runtime. And uh, it helped to sort of retain shape a bit more. So you don't shoot a thing and it just, it just crumbles into its bits. It's just making sure it has the right physical feel to it. And that was quite crucial. Joints, um, again, were based on uh, geometry hierarchy. So we'd provide a joint node and then they would know which two other nodes to connect. And uh, they could break based on an impulse strength. And we had like six degrees of freedom, revolute fixed various properties you can set on them. Um, and uh, that would be driving the creation of those. Uh, the breaking of joints, there's one interesting aspect to this. Uh, again, the breaking was sort of done between the chunk pieces. So again, I think the lowest node it could find that they could be attached to, because what that means is that you can break the attached, I can break rigid body one in this case, and I'm still connected. So if you imagine the, uh, uh, an RB1 being a door and RB2 being the wall, you can shoot the door, the door would break, it would still be connected and sort of flap around in the hinge, uh, which is um, a little bit of extra work, I guess, to handle, but it really means uh, a more believable behavior. So you shoot a door, the door is still there. It's actually quite fun if you're kicking the toilet door in control. Uh, it's still there, it still flops like a door. And that's that's a really nice uh, detail to, again, re retain believability. 
and the sort of the the presence of the material and the thing that you're actually destroying. Now, on the actual simulation side, um, everything's fun in North Flight. Uh, so the data and hierarchy handling, all that processing of the data that comes in, the breaking logic, the particle spawning, and all that auxiliary stuff around it is all handled in-house in, in sort of proprietary code. The actual physics sim itself is physics, um, RB simulations and constraints. Uh, that's sort of the backbone of the actual physics simulation. Uh, and then they basically both talk um, to get the data back and forth how we need it. Now, uh, as a demonstration here, this is sort of showing the same scene we had before, but now uh, just having rigid bodies in here and no particles and no decals. So this is basically what happens. So I'm going through with the mouse again, clicking on things, breaking them, which is actually quite a lot of fun. I've lost a lot of time on preparing this uh, by just going in and, and doing that, which is really cool. And it feels almost a bit like what the game feels like when you play it. Um, but that shows this is just rigid bodies and you're like, ah, it's not bad, it's kind of cool, but it's also a little bit, something's missing, something is not really there. Well, we're missing particles. So the next layer we're talking about is the particle layer. And um, in this one, everything is systematic and event driven. And we have so specific events that happen. So a bullet impacts on a specific um, shape and then has a specific material. We have the bond between different chunks breaking. They have a specific material. And we also have a situation where um, at some point we have too many rigid bodies in the scene uh, where we just have to get rid of them. And conveniently, we can just sort of crumble them into particles and then the particles slowly disappear. Um, so you have some kind of rigid body despawning effect. And uh, those uh, three uh, uh, events are like the main events that are driving uh, what happens to an object. And uh, they are material based. So they have to be defined by material. Now the editing uh, of the materials was uh, of the particles was fantastic. Uh, essentially, um, uh, to just show you that, you see here on the left uh, just a, a sort of a particle system placed on the floor, um, and that's sort of a, a, a concrete breaking effect. And then I just go in. I think I'm just adding some extra sparks to this, so and you can see in real time what's happening. You can just go back and forth and think, okay, cool. That's maybe that is actually not nice. I don't want sparks. And you're like, oh, actually, maybe I need to add more rocks. So I go in and I add some rocks and it is up the emission frequency. You can change any of the properties and you will have a live view in game, which is uh, quite a nice uh, thing to have. It makes it very easy to work. And uh, then for me, coming from film, um, you don't do that usually. Um, you have some kind of preview, but really getting it sort of in the, in the final output is, is quite, a nice, uh, quite a nice aspect uh, to get used to. One uh, part of the particle simulation that might be of interest is that we, uh, uh, for rendering purposes, create an SDF to do uh, reflections. Um, and uh, in this case, we're actually taking this rendering SDF and we uh, push it back into the CPU and use it for particle collisions because it's sort of close enough to get some kind of collision going that is, uh, uh, that is fine. Obviously, if you want more detailed collision, you need to do a rigid body that actually lands on the floor and can stay there. But particles, generally, they fly around and shoot around and then they sort of despawn. And uh, yeah, what you just saw is basically this area um, uh, in the research sector again that just shows you how the real world looks like compared to the SDF. For collisions, it's absolutely fine. It's a really good uh, principle. In comparison, left with our particles, on the right with particles, so we're clearly filling in some gaps. Uh, so we're clearly adding something that sort of makes makes our, our granularity gradient sort of be a bit more uh, filled up already. We have more places in there. And uh, to go back to the same scene, now if I play this one back, this is now the same kind of thing happening using particles as well. And um, what you see is that there's a whole different level of sort of uh, reward and feel in there. Not only the sparks, but in general, there's sort of uh, the aftermath is just, it's just not as pristine and clean and there's sort of little bits flying about and you just have a different level of scale that really helps um, sort of convey the impact much better. Uh, and it's even more fun to play with and you can lose even more time doing that. Now, the last bit I want to talk about is uh, material decals. Um, so what you basically do is you create a, a texture, a texture with a normal map and um, uh, different diffuse maps and spec maps and smooth maps, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you usually do that based on, well, either substance or you do a Houdini setup. Here on the right, you see our concrete breaking stuff in the floor. 
um, to, uh, uh, that is literally Houdini sim uh, that is run. We basically only need a single frame for that. We don't need the extra sim, but uh, there was a little procedural setup that you know could create a lot of them um, and, and then render out the right textures uh, to be projected in game. And how that can look like, uh, let me just show you. Um, this is a variation. So this is uh, just a texture on the floor to sort of do something to the static geometry that wouldn't be doing anything. So especially if you uh, if you slam on the ground like that, or if the fire extinguisher uh, explodes, or you do the melee attack, um, uh, so you always have uh, some kind of response of your environment, although the environment doesn't actually respond. All we do is basically paint something on the wall to give you the right feel, but that really makes a difference um, in the right circumstances. So the same scene again, and starting, well, there isn't really all that much decaling going on. There's a bit of glass on the floor and maybe a bit of concrete bits that you can't really, really see. And that's why I just went in and, 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 and uh, uh, did the launch uh, as well. So I took the bench and slammed it into the floor. And then you see the floor cracked, although the floor didn't crack, but it did crack. Uh, because we added a decal and that kind of adds the additional layer that is kind of needed to tie in the big static pieces into the dynamic objects that are floating about and then also adding uh, uh, like little grainy bits on the floor that just remain um, sort of as an aftermath and um, that is um, quite uh, important that sort of fills the the gradient and the bits we haven't touched yet and sort of completes the picture now, talking about optimizations, because obviously this is happening and you kind of need to make sure that it still runs on an Xbox. Really, we only have about 200 active rigid bodies on screen at a time, which is mad. And I was surprised how few that is. Um, there is a constant culling going on, especially off camera. Uh, things just disappear. And uh, disappearing usually means they despawn into particles. Um, we also do things like collision delay on big events. So if you explode something, and that is something uh, um, known from the film world as well, uh, if you explode a thing, you really don't care that the bits themselves are sort of interacting because they're just shooting out into the initial velocity, basically. So you can turn off collision for the first, I don't know, five, 10 frames, and that saves you a lot of collision calculations. And um, the, the, they're all still flying in the same direction. Uh, but by the time you, you turn on the collisions, they're far apart enough for the um, acceleration structures to just take hold and make that collision uh, operate much quicker. So that's a good thing. Then sleeping, sleeping rigid bodies with a high threshold. So they fall asleep quite quickly. Sometimes it's noticeable. Sometimes uh, you get away with it. Um, and we're using the physics stabilization feature uh, to get to sleep even quicker. Um, and it's also the reason why we can stack things on top of each other because they basically fall asleep and become static and then you can just pile them up, which is fun to do as well. Um, yeah, and uh, not to forget to not have too many uh, blanks. We just add more particles uh, because we can do a lot more particles than rigid bodies. Um, and that usually helps to sort of hide a little bit that some parts maybe are a bit thin on the actual physics uh, side uh, due to optimization reasons. Now, uh, quickly, I want to talk about some other distraction tool chains. Um, and they're essentially implemented separately, but on the same principles. Uh, we just uh, didn't want to add everything again into the main tool. It almost highlights a little bit <laughs> where our learnings will go um, uh, because they were a bit special. So they're cloth rigs and cable rigs and uh, specific props. Um, and one example is our cloth rig, uh, again, Houdini driven. So you basically go in, you break something up into bits. Um, cloth and games is a bit funny because quite often you actually don't get a sort of a, a rest pose because you want the flag to be in a specific shape and you can't ever sim it high res enough to really look like that. And if you want physics to physics or, or the, the, the physics object to be interacting with those pieces, they have to be made like from the same kind of stuff and having cloth sims uh, in a real time environment and physics in the same that is there isn't really much integrated solving going on so this is actually just rigid bodies that are constrained together and then skinning the mesh and uh, that's sort of uh, the metadata for this is a bit more complex because you have to determine all the springiness values and all the dampening values and all those joints so it looks a bit like the cloth you want it to be um, and we use this for flags mainly in shower curtains um, and a bunch of cables and things like that um, and uh, and then there were a lot of custom props. Uh, they were like the the infamous uh, remedy um, forklift, for example, and um, 
uh, yeah, other bits uh, like lamps that sparkle or um, uh, like a water cooler you can slam on the floor and then there's water coming out of it and things like that. And um, as you see in the video, and uh, yeah, that's the basically that's custom made basically. So you might be shattering it the same way, but then you're adding specific particle effects and specific behaviors to certain things to make sure that everything is um, sort of behaving as you would. And also uh, would expect and also add uh, to create more richness. Uh, so computers sparkle when you hit, they hit them on the wall and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and that is sort of custom props and they were usually uh, handmade. Yeah. Now I want to talk about the lessons, the things that uh, sort of really stood out as things we should really um, learn from. And the first one is the quality of input geometry. The second one, name-based convention, monolithic destruction tools as a, as a subject, and then performance monitoring as the fourth. Quality of geometry. Well, uh, if you do something procedural and it's data-driven, the incoming data needs to be like nice. Uh, if your rules can't apply to that data because the data isn't really consistent, then you can't do procedural uh, and it's quite often especially if you go cross application and if, especially if you go into max you have a different orientation it's a different coordinate system it's a different scaling the material assignments might not be correct the mesh quality might be too low things are overlapping things are not watertight the usual problem is when you try to shatter something when you try to sim something and uh, obviously the houdini tools have gotten much better dealing with that but if it only breaks once in 100 cases, it still breaks and you gotta go in and fix it. Uh, poly bevel is a really touchy one. It really likes to just crash um, on some nasty stuff that comes in. And we're talking uh, 17 here, so maybe we're in a better world already. Um, so what can we do about it? We can improve the incoming data. We can standardize across the DCC our geometry pipeline. And that's what we are working on at the moment to really make sure the stuff that we're traveling, that we're traveling around from applications is consistent. Um, there's a whole big conversations about this going on and it's, 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 uh, while well, geometry is sort of the essence of everything we do in the content side. Um, so, uh, it's a big undertaking. Uh, you also want to do early sanity checking. So if something's broken, you don't want to find out when you sort of break it. You want to find out when you export it before you even give it to the person that breaks it, especially when you're looking at, uh, doing things in external development, uh, so in outsourcing, etc. And um, or you go even a step further and you actually have the embedded tools straight where the modeling happens. Someone builds a table, you give them the tools to also make the broken table and then everything is in the same spot. So that is definitely something that can be done about and we're looking into that at the moment. Name based convention. There isn't really much to say about it than never, ever, ever, ever go there um, <laughs> because names are wrong. 20% um, of the time, most of the time. And that is, it's it's just a given. And it's no one's fault. It's just when something's name-based and you need to do a lot of it, um, uh, you sort of have a regression going on over time. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and uh, naming conventions can't express a full range of data. Uh, so looking at it, you want to convey, I don't know, damping and, and limit values for joins and all kinds of different things. Um, you can't get that into a name. So you're limiting yourself to some very, very basic degrees of freedom that get you to some point. But if you want to tweak the details, you have to go in and do it manually. And that is very, very cumbersome. Um, and uh, the mesh hierarchy in our case, for example, was quite often not standard conform. So things just didn't work. What do you do with it? You abandon name-based conventions and any kind of metadata needs to be directly authored alongside with the stuff you're building. Either it's attached to the geo or it comes inseparable as a sidecar file and you have a unified API. And that is basically what we're doing now um, because uh, anything else just doesn't scale um, beyond basically control. And uh, another aspect that's a bit more of a Houdini kind of question. And um, we have to say that this was sort of the first big tool chain that has uh, happened at Remedy using Houdini. Uh, um, and for that, it did a marvelous job, but it was a monster in the end. It was a very, very big, many, many layers, um, a node network um, of partially different HDAs nested and all, all those things that at some point you know you will regret. And, um, and the longer it was sort of there, the slower and more inflexible it became. It was very, very hard to maintain. Add features, change things, train up someone else uh, uh, when I started using it. It was very hard to follow the steps. It did all the right things, but 
it wasn't apparent anymore for what reasons. And uh, the, the answer for that is really just more modular tools um, and uh, have more individual interchangeable components. And that's a quite, quite an interesting question looking at how your um, HDA architecture works in your, in your studio. Um, because while a project can take three years, right? A successful project in games takes three years. And uh, that means after three years, you need to be able to open a scene from three years ago and it needs to point to the right HDAs at the right version and make sure that everything still exports the same as back then. Um, and uh, uh, sort of that just means you need to have a proper namespace, HDA management version, uh, very stringent, very strict. There's no change that overrides something else because you just break things on the way. And um, that is that is quite uh, quite important and then you can start modularizing and then you can make a thing that does something and you know i'm not going to break anything if i add more features to it uh, that's sort of a, quite the uh, quite the essence in it and um, trying to divide and conquer is always a good idea um, maybe trying to uh, um, uh, sort of you know do one material at a time as a thing but also even lower do building blocks that are really substantial that really work and um, yeah, that, that's sort of a way how to tackle that. There isn't a golden bullet or silver bullet answer to this uh, because it always depends on the case by case, but um, quite often it is technical infrastructure underneath that can help you a lot with that, uh, especially uh, over a long production cycle. Well, performance and testing, uh, that was sort of the last big thing. Uh, there was no automated functionality to test things. Testing was you go in and you run and then you just throw things at things and see what happens. Um, preferably grenades because they break the most things and um, the issue with that is sort of uh, obviously nothing is there from the start right sort of you have an engine that does certain things but after a while things change and get optimized and um, it's very hard to retest something and then do an A for B kind of a comparison because you well have to record a video kind of thing and then compare maybe and and um, and that is the danger to have a potential regression over time that you don't notice that something stopped working that used to work before. Um, so that is that was a problem in performance testing um, in itself. Uh, there wasn't tangible metrics because if you look at FPS, that isn't really reliable. You can look at maybe how much of your frame is spent on CPU operations in the physics realm, but it's. Um, I don't know physics is not a constant thing whereas gpu problems like well it's rendering on screen and quite often there's a direct connection between what you see and how long it takes to render um, in physics it's you know you can have a perfectly propped environment and everything is fine it works wonderfully and then you have a situation in a very specific case where that combination of props and the guy with the grenade just tanks your frame rate and it's very hard because you don't want to then go in and make all those props b b less breakable because they're used all over the place. So it's very um, difficult to react at that point without, again, regressing your, your overall quality. And, uh, and that needed a bit of thinking how to go about that. <clears throat> so really is performance and testing. So we need better performance metrics. We need to basically be able to have sort of a a made up magic number. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be some tangible number in, 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 in bits per second or something. It, it has to be just a thing that says, hey, now you are in, in, in this kind of range. And if you go beyond that range, this is usually when it goes bad. And those made magic numbers can then form a proper physics budget um, that you can then uh, sort of start doing some kind of uh, automated testing. That is the second point. So you want to um, run some automated processes that just throw a grenade in every corner and then measure. So you then get sort of a heat map of uh, how bad the physics are or how, how, how magic number they are on that kind of magic number scale. And, uh, and then if it's repeatable automated testing, then you can actually do divs and see what your changes are actually providing in terms of differences. And, uh, and countermeasures, uh, you can then invent things like, hey, uh, maybe we can adjust the physics based on the current performance. So we, we increase the number of allowed rigid bodies based on how well it's going right now, or we decrease it. Um, and I think one of the big problems with that is, um, uh, and that's sort of input from our engine programmers, is sort of that there isn't all that great uh, physics metrics you can get out of physics uh, and that would be needed more information about what is actually going on what are my numbers right now to be able to react to that um, another approach for more like level design uh, uh, people and environment artists is like zoning areas based on expected load so 
Um, if you know that there's a specific fight happening in a specific corner and you kind of want to prop that up really nicely with props that are using all over the place, maybe you can say within this bounding volume, physics will be just 70% because you know when everything kicks wild, then uh, it would tank the performance. But only in that predefined area, you dial down the quality and everything else is unaffected. So this is essentially a, a yeah, zoning area is based on expected load. Um, and that would be also an approach uh, that we, we could take um, to make sure that we are performance stable, because otherwise you always trade off like a bunch of frame drop against better better feel. And it's very hard to hit that balance, especially when you go on uh, multiple platforms at the same time. Now to the conclusion. Um, well, c control has been received very well. Uh, we've been... Uh, 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 thankfully receiving quite a lot of awards uh, for the work that has been done and uh, our workflow has held up. It wasn't always easy, but it has held up and it has provided what we wanted and it has spawned a lot of ideas of what else could be done. So uh, we're feeling quite inspired and are quite excited to see where we can take this next. And with that, I've come to the end of the presentation, but I don't want to leave you guys without mentioning uh, the key people that have contributed to all of those efforts. That is at once it's Mati building the auto destruction tool and Valtteri being responsible for a lot of the uh, custom props destruction and custom scripting. Um, we have uh, Sami and Daniel working from the North Light, the engine and providing um, the core physics and particle components uh, and the rendering side. And there were a lot of other people involved in the process. This was a big team effort and many, many others contributed. Uh, all over Remedy and all over our VFX um, crew uh, to the success and to the great reception of uh, uh, what Rem uh, Remedy and uh, Control has received. So um, thanks to all of them and thank you uh, all for listening. And um, all that is left for me is basically go out with a little bang. Thank you. <laughs>